So first off, what do you study? So broadly speaking, my research is really devoted to understanding the geographic patterning of crime and reoffending. And under this broad framework, I focus on two areas. So first, a lot of my work examines the role of neighborhood change. So inherently, that's a longitudinal question. I look at these patterns over time and over space. And I look to see how these changes can impact things like crime and other types of social outcomes, including things like victimization, housing inequality, uh, and the like. And I think what's really interesting about my work is that I focus on unique social and demographic catalysts or characteristics that might be catalysts for neighborhood change and crime. Uh, so I take into uh, account transitions in housing, uh, transitions in correctional populations, and how those things all work together to impact the communities uh, that they're housed within. Um, and number two, uh, speaking of correctional populations, my work also looks at this interrelationship between communities and the concentration of justice-involved individuals. And in this work, I found largely that this concentration tends to be in just a few neighborhoods, and these, few, these neighborhoods are uh, disadvantaged, they're impoverished, they're characterized by a lot of inequality. And this has huge implications in terms of how these individuals do with regard to uh, recidivism and just outcomes from uh, uh, incarceration, but also there's an impact on the community itself. Uh, and my research suggests that these individuals actually contribute to the worsening of neighborhoods in terms of increasing or enhancing components associated with disadvantage. So what can we do as, uh, as a society or as policymakers, given what your research shows? Well, I think that context is important. And, and really, that's the common thread in, in much of my research. And, and sometimes it's really easy to forget that. Um, you know, neighborhoods matter. Uh, things like poverty, inequality, race, these dynamics have huge implications for crime and reoffending. And from a policy perspective, I guess I would say that in today's climate, there's, you know, we're in this uh, justice, uh, this social justice movement, and there's such a, a myopic focus almost on the police and th that institution in and of itself. But this is a, what is important is that police aren't inter interacting with citizens in a vacuum. They're interacting within a larger framework, within a larger context. And the meaning of that interaction is very different in an advantaged neighborhood or a white neighborhood versus a disadvantaged neighborhood or perhaps a minority neighborhood. And so failing to take into account this broader context and how it can impact these interactions, uh, you know, I, I don't think that we're going to be successful in rooting out a lot of these uh, um, in rooting out a lot of these, All right, let's, sorry. Let's, right, we're gonna stop. Sorry, I'm one of those people that has a landline. <laughs> okay, so you were talking about the differences in a white and rich neighborhood versus a poor or minority neighborhood. So let me ask you the question, why does context matter? Well, context matters because interactions don't occur in a vacuum, right? So we have an interaction, say, between a police officer and a citizen, and if that interaction is occurring in a, in a white or advantaged neighborhood versus a disadvantaged or a minority neighborhood, that might take on a different meaning. There might be differences in how that police officer interacts or how that citizen interacts because of a history, because of the, the characteristics of the community. Uh, and this is borne out in research. Um, and, and so I think if we're really going to see meaningful change, then we need to look beyond just um, these these institutions, we need to look at this broader context and, and not forget that these institutions are embedded in this broader context, this broader macro context. The police don't operate in a vacuum. Courts don't operate in a vacuum. And so until we can root out these larger patterns of inequality, of poverty, of disenfranchisement, we're going to continue to have problems. What interested you in these questions? What drew you to study these particular kinds of issues? Well, I had a really impactful moment when I was uh, had finished my master's degree and I was working at the Urban Institute and I had an interaction with Jeremy Travis. And, you know, he was working with Janet Reno and it was right when reentry was starting to become something that was on the forefront of everyone's mind. 
Uh, and he had told me that Janet Reno had turned to him and said, you know, well, what are we going to do with all these people coming out of prison? And this was after years of mass incarceration. And, you know, he had me working with him, looking at this community aspect and really understanding how communities can impact somebody's life outcomes, understanding that, you know, these individuals were coming from these impoverished neighborhoods, these neighborhoods and communities that had very little in terms of resources, that this wasn't something that was uh, an equal opportunity player across the neighborhoods of the city, right? It is something that it has a, individuals in these impoverished neighborhoods have a much higher likelihood of being incarcerated, of being involved in a crime, witnessing crime. Um, to me, I, I found that interesting to understand this, this lens of context and how that uh, can impact these bigger outcomes. Um, what brought you to academia? Why did you decide to become a professor? Well, uh, initially I had wanted to work in the public policy world for a, a RAND or an urban institute, which is where some of my background was. But academia allows you so much more freedom in terms of what you're able to study, what you're able to uh, investigate. And I enjoy the opportunity to determine my own research agenda and not to uh, have to, uh, I guess, follow what the, the funding structures are for that, but just the freedom to investigate and to have that inquiry, that intellectual inquiry of problems and and see these issues and ask the questions I want to ask and and be able to to set set the tone for that. If you were not an academic, what do you think you'd be doing? Um, if I was not an academic, what would I be doing? You know what? I'd probably be a realtor. <laughs> Why? I'm, you know, I study housing a lot. I'm fascinated with housing and housing markets, economics, investment in communities. And, and I think real estate is, it's just fun. It's fun. Um, what's the best advice you've either, you've either gotten or given? Oh, I think the best advice I've both gotten and given is to always be open to new ideas. I think sometimes it's easy to get in our little bubble of this, we classify ourselves as that, well, I study corrections or I study policing. And sometimes we shut ourselves off to new ideas, to ideas that might be outside of the box. Uh, so I think the best idea or the best advice that I was ever given was just to be open to new ideas and to uh, figure out how to follow what, what interests me and, and integrate it somehow successfully into, into my agenda, whether or not it nicely coincides or not, but just kind of figuring out uh, and following following the interests that I have. What What's something, uh, what's an interesting tidbit about you that people may not know? Oh, I am a, a huge, huge, avid Neil Diamond fan. I've seen him in concert about four or five times. I'm saddened by his Parkinson's diagnosis. I was at his, I think it was his 50th anniversary tour a few summers ago. He still rocks the sequin jumpsuit. I'm obsessed. He's amazing. <laughs>